It's time to break down the Buffalo Bills week four opponent, the challenges they present, and what the Bills need to do to deal with them today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, folks, we've had some conversations about this Bills-Dolphins matchup. We had crossover Thursday, had a bonus episode this week where I invited Coach Alexander onto the podcast to have a discussion about the Bills' defense against this Miami offense. And now it's time for me to break down this matchup in full. So we're going to do what we do here on these primers, these plotting the path to the Bills winning the game episodes and break down the Miami Dolphins from every angle and get into the keys for success for the Buffalo Bills in week four. So let's do it. The Bills are at home in week four. They host the Miami Dolphins. The game will be played on Sunday, October 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Highmark Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. The game's going to be broadcasted on CBS. Jim Nance on the play-by-play, Tony Romo, the game analyst, and Tracy Wolfson, the sideline reporter. That's CBS's top group. That's how you know it's a big game. When those guys show up, it's a big one. The game will be the 120th all-time meeting between the Bills and the Dolphins. And the Bills have a 56-62-1 all-time record against Miami, but the Bills have had a lot of recent success. They've won nine of the last 10 against the Dolphins, but Miami did play the Bills much more competitively last year, including a win in week three down in Miami. The Bills have won the last seven in Buffalo. Bills enter this game two and one. The Dolphins are three and oh. They beat the Chargers in week one, 36 to 34 in LA. They beat the Patriots in week two in New England, 24 to 17. And then last week, of course, they beat the Denver Broncos in Miami's home opener, 70-20. to Head coach of the Miami Dolphins is Mike McDaniel. He's 40 years old. He's in his second season as a Dolphins head coach. They went 9-8 and last year in, their fir- in his first season. So far, 3-0 and this year for a 12-8 and record to this point. Mike McDaniel is 1-for-7 in his career when challenging plays. Of course, McDaniel came up as a Shanahan disciple, both under Mike Shanahan and Kyle Shanahan, was with Mike and Kyle in Washington, and then he followed Kyle to Cleveland, Atlanta, San Francisco, and he's now running the show in Miami. The quarterback for the Miami Dolphins is Tua Tungavailoa, six foot, 200, 220 pounds. He's 25 years old, was a first-round pick, number five overall in 2020 by the Miami Dolphins out of Alabama. He's had 37 career starts to this point, and in those starts, the Dolphins have a 24-13 and record. Last year, Tua was statistically the best quarterback in football, not particularly close, and of course, he missed some time, but you go through the metrics, you're not going to find a more impressive statistical quarterback than Tua, and he's off to an unbelievable start so far in 2023. Let's get into some of those numbers. A completion percentage of 71.3, He's averaging 341 passing yards per game, which is just crazy. 10.1 yards per attempt, 14.2 yards per completion, passer rating of 121.9, eight touchdowns, and two interceptions. So obviously the numbers are just really, really good for Tua so far in 2023 and, of course, where they were very strong last year as well. Let's get into a few more metrics that matter that I want to bring to your attention that I think are important to kind of tell the story of Tua and um, the success that he's having and, you know, a couple of areas where maybe if you can 
lean into the why behind those numbers, you can maybe have some success slowing him down a bit. Uh, Tua Tungavailoa, he's getting the ball out of his hands unbelievably fast. Average time to throw is 2.24 seconds. That's first in the NFL, and it's he's always been a fast-triggered quarterback, but he's obviously taking that to another level. And in his previous three seasons, he was like at 2.52 or 2.53. Now he's down to 2.24. Uh, 65% of his passing attempts so far this year come out in under two and a half seconds. 14% of his passes are 20 or more yards down the field. That's seventh most in the NFL. And his average depth of target is 9.6, which is fourth in the NFL. So you have a fast triggered quarterback that's pushing the ball down the field. That's tough to deal with, especially when you consider the success that he's having throwing the football. When it comes to play action, 27.6% of Tua's throws are play action passes. That's 10th most in the NFL in terms of percentage. 9.5% of his passes are screens, and they've been very successful with screens. 9.8 yards per attempt so far this year on screens. Tua is not facing a lot of pressure. Uh, He's only been pressured on 21% of his dropbacks, which I think is the lowest in the NFL. Now, when he is pressured, the passer rating comes down. Well, when he's cut clean, his passer rating is 137. That's great. But when his when he does face pressure, which has only happened on 22 of 105 dropbacks, his passer rating comes down to 57.7, right? So a huge difference, 79-point difference in passer rating when he's pressured compared to when he's not pressured. Like I said, the problem is nobody's pressuring him uh, because he's only been pressured on 22 of 105 dropbacks so far this year. Um, And then here's another number here that stands out to me in a big way. 80.2% of Tua's throws go to his first read. And that is not a knock on him. Sometimes we talk about quarterbacks as a first read passer and they, you know, if they have to come off their, their first read and work deeper into the progression, they struggle. Well, Tua's numbers when he's holding onto the ball for over two and a half seconds and when he's going to his non-primary read, they're really good as well. But it is pretty astonishing that 80% of the time, he does throw the football to his first read. To me, that says a lot of things. First of all, it's saying that it's good scheme, right? Where Tua is aware of what they want to achieve on the play. He knows where to start his eyes, and he's making good post-snap decisions, which are the result of good pre-snap indicators, right? He's getting an understanding of what the picture's going to be, anticipates it, and gets the ball out, and he's having a ton of success. And so, you know, that's that's a number that stands out to me in a big way. And one of the biggest questions that I have for the Bills in this game defensively is how do you force Tua to hold on to the football for an extra fraction of a second, another 0.25 seconds, another half a second, right? Because you want to have the opportunity to affect him and get some pressure on him. Well, if he gets the ball out that fast, nobody's been able to get home that quickly, right? And so I think the key to getting him under pressure is getting him to not throw the ball to his first read. And I think the that's going to be a big uh, thing for Sean McDermott to figure out this week is how do you get him to hold on to the ball for another tick of a second? Now, here's the good news. The Bills' defense so far this year is has been very good at the opposing quarterback not throwing to their primary read. Only 54.7% of the time has the opposing quarterback thrown the ball to their first read in a progression against the Bills. That's second lowest in the NFL. So a very interesting dynamic and contrast here of a team that is great at throwing the ball to their first read against a defense that is great in not allowing you to throw the ball to that first read. And I think that's going to be a critical component for the Buffalo Bills this week on defense is forcing Tua to work deeper into the progression, come off that first read, make decisions, and then hopefully you can get some pressure on the guy. And so when it comes to Tua, I think there's two questions. How do you get that quick pressure? And then how do you get him to to hold on to that ball for an extra tick or so? All right, so that's Tua. That's Mike McDaniel. That's the nuts and bolts. Now we're going to get into a conversation about this Miami offense against the Bills defense. But before we do, I need to tell you about DoorDash. If you need fresh groceries for the week, but you don't have time to go to the store, Try grocery delivery from DoorDash. You'll get everything you want delivered when you need it right to your door. You've trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites, and now you can get grocery delivery that actually delivers too. You'll get exactly what you ordered 
or they'll make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them out for yourself. Got a deal for you. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value when you use code LOCKDOWNNFL at checkout. Limited time offer, terms apply. That's 50% off up to $20, no minimum subtotal, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter promo code LOCKDOWNNFL. Don't forget that's code LOCKDOWNNFL for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. All right, folks, let's talk about this Miami offense against the Bills defense. The coordinator for this offense is Frank Smith, 42 years old, but Mike McDaniel is the play caller here. And last year, Miami's offense under Frank Smith and Mike McDaniel was 11th in scoring and 6th in yards. Now, so far this year, They are putting up crazy numbers. They're scoring 43 points per game. That's number one in the league. And they're averaging 550 yards per game. Of course, that's also number one in the league through three games. Let me give you some metrics here that I think matter when it comes to the Miami offense. Uh, They're scoring points on 58.3% of drives. That's number one. That's a really high mark. Uh, 8.3% of their drives result in a turnover. That's eighth, and I think they've thrown two interceptions, but they've had some fumbling issues, particularly with some snap exchanges and the speed of offense that they like to play with and Tua kind of just pulling out very quickly uh, on some of those center uh, exchanges when he's under center. That's something to be mindful of. Uh, 46% of their third down conversions, they get a first down on. That's seventh best in the NFL. Been really good in the red zone, 11 of 14 scoring touchdowns in the red zone. That's 79%. That's first in the NFL. And they're also running the ball really effectively. 6.1 yards per carry rushing the ball. That's number one in the NFL. Of course, a huge rushing output last week against Denver, over 300 yards and a bunch of rushing touchdowns. And they're also getting a ton of yards when they throw the football. 10.4 net yards per passing attempt. That's first in the NFL. This offense is off to an incredible start. And that's why I did an entire bonus episode yesterday with Coach Alexander to talk about that offense and what the Bills uh, defense can do to deal with it. But some of my own personal thoughts here, when you think about this Dolphins offense, I think some of the key principles about who they are is it's about creating leverage and using speed to attack the leverage. And they've got fast guys, right? You know about this, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, Raheem Mostert, uh, Devon Achan. I, I think that's how he wants you to say his name now which is like the third time he's changed how you want to say his name. Uh, D.A., the rookie running back out of Texas A&M. You know, these guys are really, really fast, and they're football technicians, as Mike McDaniel would say, right? They're not just fast guys. You've seen fast guys. T.J. Graham, fast guy, not a good football player. These guys are fast guys that are also very good football players. And so speed, leverage, and they do a great job of pre-snap motion. The highest uh, amount of motion that you'll see in the entire NFL is with the Miami Dolphins. And this scheme is really dynamic, and they do a really good job running it. And Tua has really taken full ownership of this offense, and he knows how to execute it. He's a master of this offense, and it runs at a high level. You know, they they laid the foundation last year for this for this offense and what they want it to be, and you know, I think that was a really important foundational year. They certainly had their injuries that they had to work through. And one of my big questions coming into this year for Miami was, all right, what's the counterpunch? Because – They had some really big offensive games last year, but then there were other times where it just wasn't as dynamic. They didn't score as many points. There were times where you felt like maybe the blueprint was out there for how to stop this offense. And then there's been an entire offseason, and start you start to wonder, okay, what's the counterpunch? What does McDaniel have in his bag to evolve this scheme and kind of counter what some of those answers have been that were put on tape? And so far, the counterpunch has been haymakers, right? I mean, this guy has absolutely come into this season pulling all the right levers uh, for how he wants to evolve this offense. And so uh, between that and Tua's mastery of what they want to do and his full understanding and his his footwork and this these skill players and their understanding of how to get to their spots, it's a lot to deal with. And so they create leverage, they attack it with speed, and they've got a quarterback that knows what he's doing running this offense and he's got a quick trigger, and he's accurate, right? A lot to deal with, and of course, now they have this running game that has a lot of speed, and it's just been really successful. They're scoring a lot of points. Uh, You're going to see a zone rushing scheme, a lot of wide zone. They do have some gap runs. They 
They ran crack toss last week against Denver quite a bit. And so you have to be ready for a pretty diverse run scheme with a lot of speed. Uh, It's interesting. They are run blocking extremely well. Uh, Right now, this year, they are averaging 2.4, excuse me, 2.54 yards before contact. So they are their running backs are getting 2.54 yards on average before they're touched, third best in the entire NFL. I will tell you the Bills are fourth in that metric at 2.11. So two teams here that are run blocking really, really well. Let's talk about their personnel. Wide receiver, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, you know about those guys. They are speed merchants, and they're not just fast guys. They're route technicians with ball skills that can create after the catch, that can win at all levels of the field. They are a problem. Their third guy is Braxton Berrios, who they signed. Probably remember him from the Jets. Good slot receiver, good return guy. And they've also got some depth here. Eric Uzakama, he's injured. Um, they haven't used him as much in the passing game this year, but they've they've used him quite a bit on some of these, these uh, horizontal runs. And there's been varying levels of success with that. They also have River Craycraft, who's a nice player. I think he's injured. I don't think he's going to be available for this game. Uh, so maybe a little bit more. Uh, going to Braxton Berrios in this one. Uh, but Tyreek Hill, off to a crazy start, 412 yards in three games, uh, has been targeted 35 times out of 101 total passes from Tua. So I'm not a math guy, but what's that, like 35% of the passing uh, plays have gone to Tyreek Hill? And so you, know, you got to deal with that guy, and he's a problem. Also, Jalen Waddle, who's having a, a good start to the year. He missed last week, so he's played in two of three games and has – 164 yards on eight t- uh, on eight catches. That's over 20 yards per reception. And then Barrios has seven catches for 103 yards in three games. So you know, Barrios is a nice player, but this is about Tyreek Hill. This is about Jalen Waddle, and those guys are really good. Uh, running back Raheem Mostert, the lead running back, and then they drafted Devin Achan out of Texas A&M. Smaller running back, but he is really really explosive. And he had his big breakout game against Denver, was the AFC Offensive Player of the Week. And um, he's really good. So Mostert, 41 carries for 241 yards and six touchdowns in three games this year. And then uh, Achan, 19 rushes, 208 yards, two touchdowns so far this season. And um, I expect those two guys to be their primary ball carriers in this game. Now, when you talk about the Miami running backs, you should mention Alec Ingold, who's their fullback. Uh, one of the best fullbacks in the league, a big part of what they do. They they live in two formations, 21 personnel, two backs, one tight end, and 11 personnel, one running back, one tight end. And um, Alec Ingold is a big part of what they do. He's a very good blocker, good, good option for um, getting out in front of some of these runs that they like to run. And, um, you know, they're paying him pretty, pretty handsomely to be their fullback, and he's important for their operation. At tight end, Durham Smythe is their tight end. He's been there since 2018. He's been a modest producer in the passing game. I've kind of expected them to add more to their tight end room, which they reworked it a bit this year, but not anything significant in terms of investment with free agent dollars or um, draft picks. They Tyler Croft is part of the mix here, um, but you know, Durham Smith Smythe is kind of their guy. They don't really run much 12, so... Uh, the one tight end on the field has typically been Durham Smythe this year. Modest producer, uh, kind of a does his job type guy. I don't think he's an overly dynamic blocker, which is interesting because you feel like that'd be an important part of what they want to achieve with this wide zone uh, rushing offense. But I think their tackles and how they use Ingold helps them uh, overcome that. But a pretty modest option at tight end. Their offensive line, I know this has been a big topic of conversation. Uh, Their left tackle, Teron Armstead, he's healthy. He missed the first two games but came back for Denver. We know when he's healthy, he's one of the best offensive tackles in the game. At left guard, it's Isaiah Wynn, former first-round pick of the Patriots, played left tackle for them. He comes over to Miami this year and plays left guard. He's off to a good start. Connor Williams is their center. He's injured with a groin, uh, missed, you know, he came out of that Denver game, and Liam Eichenberg went in at center. And if Williams is unable to go, Eichenberg's probably going to be the starting center. And I think that would be a big hit to Miami if they had to play Buffalo with Eichenberg instead of Connor Williams. So I would definitely be paying attention to his status throughout the week. They got a quality right guard in Robert Hunt. Um, I think he's certainly an above average starter. He's in a contract year and um, he's really physical mauler in the run game. 
good player. And then Austin Jackson's their right tackle, former first round pick, um, has had some ups and downs, mostly downs, has had injuries. Looks like he's off to a decent start here in 2023 at right tackle, a pivotal year for him uh, in his development and his opportunity to be an answer for Miami up front. But um, you kind of look at this this unit, and if Connor Williams is is healthy, uh, quality left tackle, quality center, quality right guard, um, Wynn has been good at left guard, and then, of course, I guess your weak link here is Austin Jackson, and that'll probably be your best opportunity. I think he's given up seven pressures so far this year, um, which relative to the amount of pressures this team has given up, that's a fairly high amount. I think six of the pressures, they've only given up like 20 pressures all year. The other six came from Kendall Lamb, who's a reserve tackle that filled in for Teron Armstead. So they are getting it done here protection-wise. So what are my keys for this Bills defense against this Miami offense? I've got five things down. Number one, I think the defensive line has got to be disruptive. You have to get quick pressure. You have to reset the line of scrimmage against the run. And you got to get your hands up in throwing lanes uh, when you're rushing the passer, right? Tua gets the ball out quick, and you're not always going to be able to get home, but what you can do is affect those throwing windows by getting your hands up and trying to, you know, of course, bat down the ball, but also just move Tua a little bit, maybe not have the access that he thinks he's going to have when he's pulling the trigger. So disruptive D-line, I think that's the foundation of of the Bills' defensive success against Miami. If they're going to, you know, be able to limit this offense, it's going to start with their defensive line being disruptive, getting quick pressure, playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage against the run and getting their hands up into throwing windows. Number two is you have to win defensively in the red zone. Uh, Miami, number one red zone offense in the NFL so far this year, 79% scoring touchdown percentage, 11 of 14. Bill's red zone defense has been really good. Uh, been the number one red zone defense in the NFL since 2020, and they're off to a great start this year. They've only given up two touchdowns and 11 trips to the red zone this year, 29%. And so when you're on defense, you got to be thinking about them getting field goals and them not getting touchdowns. Um, and the reality is this this offense is going to get yards. They're going to make plays. They're going to have explosive moments. You have to keep playing and be resilient. And when it comes down to getting into that red zone, you have to tighten the screws when it becomes a condensed area of the field. That's going to be critical. Can you win in the red zone and hold them to field goals and not score touchdowns? That's going to be a key principle of this football game. I think number three is you have to have sound co communication and you have to play fast. You know, this motion-based Miami offense that wins with timing, speed, and leverage, it's going to stress your zone defense, right? You have to be outstanding communicators, and you have to play fast. And you'd like to think that the experience that the Bills have in the secondary with those guys playing together, Taron Johnson, Matt Milano, Trey White, Jordan Poyer, Micah Hyde, five of your seven back seven defenders have all been together since 2018, and all of them have been together uh, since 2017, minus Taron Johnson. So you have guys that have seen every route imaginable, every concept imaginable, and they have to they have to be good communicators and play fast. This isn't a game to hesitate. If you hesitate, they're going to get the ball and they're going to be behind you. And so trust your time on task together and play fast and try to cut off those routes the best you can. Number four is Taron Johnson. This is There's a lot on Taron Johnson's shoulders this week as the Bills starting slot that also you know, has big responsibilities fitting the run, and they're going to probably go after him a bit. They had some success with that in the second game last year, the one in Buffalo where the Bills were um, in their red uniforms. The snow came towards the end, uh, not the playoff game. So Taron Johnson, how can he meet this moment? He's going to have a big role defending the run and fitting the run, but also the passing game, right? He's going to be uh, a critical piece in uh, being able to crowd some routes early, being able to uh, cap routes over the middle of the field. I think Taron Johnson and his performance on Sunday will be pivotal in the Bills having success or not. And then number five, right? We talked about this Miami defense, or excuse me, this offense, all the unique challenges that they present. But I think at the bottom line, it's this. You have to be true to who you are as a defense. Yes, Miami stresses you in unique ways, but you still have to play your style of football. You can't try to be so become something that you're not this week. And I've had some really fun conversations in the subtext with different um, – listeners that have asked questions about Miami and even suggested some ideas for what the Bills can do defensively. And they're very different than what the Bills are, right? You can't just all of a sudden morph into something else for a week, right? You you have a, a core principle and a philosophy about who you want to be as a defense, and you got to be that. You have to be that. You can't try to become something you're not for this week. 
So stay true to who you are. Play your style of football. Have the wrinkles necessary to account for what Miami's going to do. But play your style of defense. The question I'd be asking myself if I'm Sean McDermott this week is, what does Mike McDaniel want me to do defensively? And then I would focus really hard on not doing that, but staying true to who you are as a defense. All right, in just a moment, we're going to talk about the Bills' offense against this Miami defense. But first, I need to tell you about game time. You know what? You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event and you're in luck because game time is here. It is the fastest and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They've got killer deals on last-minute tickets. They have all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game work, or excuse me, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets, and they have an awesome app. They have flash deals, last-minute tickets, images of seat views, great prices. The app is easy to navigate. You don't have to plan months in advance to get tickets. They have deals right up to the day of the event. And I love that the tickets are sent directly to your phone. You don't have to dig through emails right to your phone. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWNNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKDOWN20, LOCKDOWNNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, let's talk about this Miami Dolphins defense. The coordinator is now Vic Fangio, 65 years old. and He's in his first season with Miami as their defensive coordinator. He has 21 years of experience as an NFL defensive coordinator and three as a head coach, of course, with the Denver Broncos. Has an incredible resume, one of the best defensive coaches in this era of football, and he's a big boost to this defense. Now, they're still coming together on that side of the football, but this is fundamentally a different philosophy in terms of defensive structure than it was under Josh Boyer, who had been there, you know, of course, last year with Mike McDaniel, but even with Brian Flores, you know, they ran a lot of blitzing, a lot of man coverage. That's not Fangio at all. It's, it's very, very, very different. So let's get into the metrics that matter here. So far this year, they're allowing 23.7 points per game. That's 21st in the NFL. They're allowing 5.7 yards per passing attempt. That's 15th. 4.6 4.6 rushing yards per carry. That's 25th. They're 45.2% on third down, which is 23rd, and 63.6% red zone touchdown percentage, which is 21st. So, you know, the raw data here, not, not great, right? It's, it's it's probably a tick below average across the board. I still think they're coming together as a defense, and I, I think they're very, very talented, but still adjusting to the new scheme. Some other metrics here. Uh, they're allowing 2.28 yards before contact against the run. That's second worst in the NFL. And they're one of just three teams higher than 1.9. And so other teams are able to kind of find some space running the football against this team. Uh, By comparison, the Bills are 24th at 1.1 yards before contact against the run. Uh, They're getting pressure on the quarterback on 22.7% of passing plays. That's 15th, so right in the middle of the pack. They're getting a sack on 6.6% of passing plays. That's 15th. And they're blitzing 30% of the time, which is 12th most frequent in the NFL. When it comes to their personnel, a lot of familiar names here. Their defensive tackles, Christian Wilkins, Zach Sealer, Raquan Davis, their primary three. Of course, Christian Wilkins um, playing for that new contract. They couldn't get something down before the season. We know what he is as a run defender, the pass rushing rushing. Uh, productivity hasn't been there, but I think you know that's really going to unlock itself a bit more with Vic Fangio, and he's certainly looking for a big payday, and getting a bunch of sacks would help him do that. Zach Sealer, who they just locked up to a long-term extension, he's the running mate for Christian Wilkins. Both these guys are very stout. They're disciplined rushers. Uh, they're very good run defenders, a really nice pair of defensive tackles. And then Raekwon Davis is kind of their A-gap defender, nose tackle, um, I think he's kind of faded quite a bit. I thought there was some, some promise to his career early on, um, but you know he has not been quite as effective of late. Big, huge human being, long arms, um, but you know his ability to work laterally and, and do anything as a pass rusher is pretty minimal. Um, and they don't have much depth there. I think that's probably a concern that I would have is what do they have at defensive tackle outside of Wilkins and Sealer? You love Wilkins and Sealer. You don't really like much else about that defensive tackle room. At defensive end, Bradley Chubb is one of their primary edge rushers. Um, obviously, traded a first-round pick. They're paying him pretty handsomely. 
Um, you know, he can affect football games, but I don't think his raw production has been quite what anybody would want at this point. He certainly made some plays. You go back to that Patriots game, forced a key fumble. Uh, but you know, I think they're looking for a bit more impact out of him. Jalen Phillips, young pass rusher uh, out of Miami. He's been off to a, a really intriguing start to his career. He's got all the tools in the world to be an impact pass rusher. And um, he's battling some injuries right now that has maybe taken away from his effectiveness so far this year. But I think he's got a really high ceiling. They love to get Andrew Van Ginkle going. They will use him as an edge rusher. They'll use him as an off-ball linebacker. He's a very versatile uh, player for them. And um, every time I watch the Dolphins, I'm impressed with Van Ginkle. He plays so hard. He's all over the place and um, finds a way to make an impact. He's, he's definitely one of those true grit guys, uh, plays hard and, and makes plays. And Emmanuel Agba, who they extended a couple of years ago. He's been injured and he's kind of that other guy there when it comes to this defensive end rotation. So I think there's a decent amount of talent here. I think this is a really good group. I don't think the production has quite been there yet this year, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time because there's a lot of talent there and Wilkins and Sealer and Chubb and Phillips, a lot of, a lot of good players there. At linebacker, Jerome Baker, uh, that's, you know, he's been there for a long time. Uh, he's still around. And then his running mate is David Long, who they signed to come over from the Titans. Uh, he's been pretty effective this year. And they'll mix in Van Ginkle as well, uh, playing off the ball a little bit. Their cornerbacks, obviously, they don't have Jalen Ramsey at this point. Um, he'll be a big boost to this defense once he's back. But uh, I think the two guys that you're going to see for sure are Xavier Howard. Of course, you know Xavier Howard. And Cater Kohu. Uh, who was a revelation for them last year? Uh, UDFA, I think, out of Texas A&M Commerce, uh, wound up being an answer for them, and looks like he's going to be a fixture long term. I think he'll be on the field a lot, uh, probably every snap. Uh, but where he plays is going to be fascinating because they've been they've been mixing it up here at corner, where Justin Bethel actually last week played in the slot for them. They have Eli Apple as well, and so you're going to get Howard and Kohu. Those guys will be on the field. And then what else do they do? Do they play Apple outside and put Kohu in the slot? Do they put Kohu outside and put Bethel in the slot? I mean, there's options here, which could also mean they play three safeties, right? I mean, there, you get to their safeties, Javon Holland. I mean, by the end of the year, we might be talking about Javon Holland as the best safety in football. Really special player um, that can make plays in a variety of ways. I think he's... Uh, an absolute budding star. If he, if people don't think he's a star yet, I I mean, to me, he is. He's unbelievable. And Deshaun Elliott is, is, is his running mate. But they could go three safeties. So if they want to play Howard and Kohu outside, could Brandon Jones play in the slot, who's only played 18 snaps this year, looked like he was going to be a starter, tore his ACL last year, um, but hasn't necessarily had a role this year. Is that Does that change this, this week of physical safety with athleticism? Do they want to keep him? Uh, down in the box, play on these tight ends that the Bills are going to present. Obviously, Josh Allen and his threat to run and get outside the pocket. I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do with the slot. So I think you're going to see four players for sure, Howard, Kohu, Holland, and Elliott as the corners and safeties. And then you could see a mix of options with what they do with that other DB, whether it's Justin Bethel, Eli Apple putting Kohu in the slot or playing with Brandon Jones as maybe a bigger slot player. So We'll see. You know, they they got to figure that out. But those are some of the options, I think, that are on the table. As for my keys for the Bills offense against the, the Dolphins defense, number one, take care of the football. You got to take care of the football. There's This isn't the game to give them extra possessions and take possessions away from yourself. You have to value the ball. You can't turn it over. And this is a team that's going to test Josh Allen's patience. This isn't Josh Boyer blitzing man coverage. You know, Vic's going to play zone. He's going to pick his spots to send pressure. and if you go back to the way that they played the Chargers, Justin Herbert, big athletic elite quarterback, they tested his patience and he just kept on working the flats and throwing the ball and dumping it down. And um, you you have to be mindful of that. They're going to really take away your explosives down the field. And so Josh is going to have to you know, take what the defense gives him and be selective with when he pushes the ball down the field. And so, you know, sometimes whenever you test Josh Allen's patience, it works out for you as a defense. Josh is going to have to play smart football on Sunday. Number two, Josh Allen running the football. I think Josh Allen's involvement this week, obviously throwing the ball, but I, I would I would lean into him as a runner. I'd have five to eight plays in this game 
where it's QB run, design QB run. Vic Fangio will play light boxes, and we've talked about running the football. It's often about math, right? How do you get more players uh, in the box than they have in there? And they're willing to concede that, and you can really make them pay by involving your quarterback in the run game because you know typically quarterbacks just hand off the ball and they become unimportant on rundowns. If they run the ball, you are playing offense with 11 guys, and you can really take advantage of it. And so not that I think Josh Allen's involvement in the run game should be at a high volume on most weeks, but this is one of those games where I think you lean into that and make sure that you get Josh Allen going on some QB power, get him going off, off tackle, uh, pin and pull with Josh Allen. I'd be doing that for sure this week. Number three is test this run defense. It's been shaky. They gave up 233 rushing yards against the Chargers in week one. They're allowing 2.28 yards before contact. They're allowing 4.6 yards per carry. I would definitely be testing out this run defense. And, you know, obviously Josh Allen being a part of that, but continuing to work James Cook and sprinkle in Damian Harris and Latavius Murray. Test this run defense. And then number four, just like I said, on the other side of the ball, you got to win in the red zone. You have to score touchdowns. The Bills have been okay scoring touchdowns in the red zone, 8 of 13, 61.5% so far this year. That's 11th best in the NFL. And Miami's red zone defense hasn't been that good. 7 of 11, they are allowing touchdowns 64% of the time. That's 21st in the NFL. You got to score touchdowns when you get it down close, and you want to keep them from scoring touchdowns when they get it down close. So, you know, the margins can be slim in a game like this. Winning in the red zone is going to be critical. Real quick on special teams, their kicker is Jason Sanders. He's been their kicker since 2018, and he's been super inconsistent. He has two seasons that are unbelievable, over 90%. One of them, he became an all-pro and got a big contract. And then he has two seasons below 77%. Last year, he was 81%. And um, so far this year, he's four of six. For his career, he's 82% making field goals. So high-variance kicker and um, a guy that when he's on, he's on. But it feels like he's been off a little bit more than he's been on lately. Their punter is Jake Bailey. He's only punted the ball five times this year, just like the Bills have only punted the ball five times this year. I think the next closest is Dallas with eight punts. Um, But Jake Bailey, first year with the Dolphins, um, coming over from New England, he was their punter for the first four years of his career. But his first two years in New England were really good, and then he kind of tapered off. They let him walk in free agency. He signs with Miami. Uh, Small sample size this year, but he's 29th in EPA per punt. So we'll see. I've I've watched all three Dolphins game, and I, I, I think he's been just okay as a punter. The returner is Braxton Berrios. He handles both punt and kick return. I think he's one of the most reliable return men in the entire NFL. But this special teams unit has not been consistent. You know, not that there's been any one area that's been a problem, but they're last in the NFL in special teams DVOA. They've missed a field goal. They've had a field goal blocked. They've allowed a kick return for a touchdown. Their punting has been below average to this point. And so when you think about those margins and those X factors that, you know, could decide a game like this, perhaps the Bills have a special teams advantage. Although I don't think the Bills kick and coverage units, kick and punt coverage units have been overly good this year, but their punting has been good. Their uh, return game has been fine. And of course, Tyler Bass is perfect so far on the season. So you definitely want to continue um, some of what you're doing special teams wise. And, you know, maybe that's an area in this game that can, tip the scales in your favor. So there you have it. The Miami Dolphins, the keys for success on both sides of the football and obviously an important early season AFC East showdown. Now, we have one more conversation coming for you uh, ahead of this game where on Saturday morning, I'm going to drop my final thoughts. We're going to talk to Dr. Kyle Trimble of Banged Up Bills about the injuries and then, of course, my five predictions for the game on Sunday. So don't miss it. Make sure that you're subscribed. Would love it. If you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast, have a great rest of your day. Go Bills, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.